you that we can come here today and hear from you. God, your presence is awesome in our lives. And Father, thank you for using musicians and voices, God, to lift praise to you. We want to lift you up in this place. We want to soak you in. We want to feel your presence, God. So my prayer is that you would remove anything in this room right now. Thought, obstacle, idol, anything that's idolatrous that would keep us from seeing and hearing from you through your word and through the anointing of your Holy Spirit in this place today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome. Happy New Year. I think you can do better than that. Happy New Year. It's two days away, right? You can't say it, right? We debated on happy holiday or Merry Christmas, but what do you say between the two, right? He just starts saying happy, merry, yes, something, Christmas, New Year. How many of you have ever been asked the question, hey, by the way, where are you from? <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. And, and when I tell folks that I'm from Havasu, they go, no, really, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from Havasu. I've been in Havasu since 04. I'm from Havasu. Okay, so where's home? Havasu. Okay, then they go back to, okay, where were you born? Now, that's a different story, right? And we answer that question. Well, today, we're going to talk about that journey home, the Christmas journey. It's about where was Jesus from? Now, we could label some places like where was Jesus born? He was born in? He was born in? It's Bethlehem. You can say it out loud. He was born in? Yeah, some of you are going, oh, that might not be right. I ain't saying it. <laughs> he was born in Bethlehem. And his parents had journeyed to Bethlehem. But the, the story that we're going to talk about, even the scripture is headed, the return to Nazareth. So it kind of reminded me this morning as I was sitting there, when I go back to Georgia, it's the return to Georgia, right? But that's not home. Home is Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Home is where the family is that's here. So as we talk about the return to Nazareth, you would say, well, wait a minute. If he was born in Bethlehem, wouldn't he have gone and returned back there? Because he was just a little guy. So let's look at Scripture and see what Scripture has to say, and let's unpack it just a little bit. Matthew chapter 2, if, uh, if you've got your Bible, starting in verse 19. And if you happen not to have a Bible, we've got some Bibles that are in the pews that are like this. Uh, pull one out, open it to page 1027, and you'll be following right along with us. And, uh, and by the way, if you don't have a personal Bible, that's why we have them in the pews. Not only that, but if you have a friend that you may want a gift or bless with a Bible, take one of these Bibles, put it in their hand, and challenge them. Hey, here's something that may change your life. I just challenge you to read it. Let's start in verse 19, the return to Nazareth. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child, his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose, and he took the child. Who was the child that he took? Ah, oh, yellow right there. And his mother, who was? Woo, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Now listen very carefully why we say that he is from Nazareth. And he went and lived in a city called... He went and lived in a city called so that when he was spoken of by the prophet might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, here's the cool part of this story. As we look at this, this actually was a fulfilling of prophecy. The pieces of the puzzle were being put together. Now, let me remind you how this puzzle began to look. We talked about a young couple that uh, were betrothed to one another, and Mary goes to her husband and says, guess what? Bet you, bet you can't guess. <laughs> and obviously he didn't. I'm pregnant. And it's by God. Okay, sure you are. And he makes a decision. Okay, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be respectful because I love this woman. God appears to him, changes his mind. He accepts the fact that, okay, she's telling me the truth. 
Society probably didn't embrace that real well, do you think? I mean, sometimes you can confess things and you can be all good with it, but the folks that didn't see the reconciliation are still holding those grudges, and they were looking and going, you know what, I think they're lying. But God chose for them to journey. A census came about. So it gets them away from all of the, the gossip, probably. It goes to a place where Jesus was born, named, oh, I see, y'all are good, named Bethlehem. He's born. He appears to, to, the, uh, to the shepherds that, uh, that Julie was talking about, proclaims that, that a king is going to be born. Go and worship the king. And the child is born, and they are warned to leave. The holy family travels to a different place. Shows up three wise men bearing gifts. King Herod, we came to worship. Why would they have gone to King Herod? Because if you'd have heard it, there was a new king that was born, wouldn't you think you'd go to the palace because the assumption would have been that it was Herod's child, the new king. And they went to worship, and Herod goes, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Something's wrong with this picture. Matter of fact, it just downright upset him to the point that he made a decree that I think is one of the most awful things that could happen to society. He declared that any male child under two years of age be killed, a slaughter. We talked about a slaughter of the innocents. A two-year-old baby had no decision in that. Why? Because he wanted to protect his kingdom so bad, his prideful arrogance so bad. Now, fast forward. The holy family's over here in Egypt land. And I don't know about you guys. Sometimes when you're away from home and visiting, it's like really cool. For a little while, and then you start going, I want to go home, right? And so an angel appears to the Holy Family and says, okay, you can go home. They're journeying home. They're booking home. And in the midst of that, a uh, thought process, wait a minute. Herod's dead, but his son's on the throne. Hmm. What do most sons want to do for their fathers. Please them, right? Carry out their orders, right? Fulfill their destiny, right? So Joseph gets to thinking, oh, wait a minute. This could, this could go bad for the family. This could be a trick. And he was afraid. Now, I think that points out to us, it's okay to be afraid about circumstances because God did not instill a spirit of fear within us. But it's not okay to live in fear constantly. And so God needed to get Joseph's attention, and he appeared to him in a dream. And he said, okay, detour. I need you to go to the Galilee area, and here's the town, and it's called Nazareth. That, by the way, they didn't have the scripture then for Joseph to look it up and go, oh, yeah, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy that's why we're going to Nazareth. God chose to fulfill the prophecy. Joseph chose to be obedient and lead his family to where God directed him to go. And so we pick up the story, heir to the return to Nazareth. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you just really love when you're on trips to run into detours? I'm going to take it by the laughs that the majority of you have run into detours. How many of you have run into a detour? Now, when you ran into that detour, you looked at the person in the car with you and you said, Yay, we've got a detour. Let's pull over and wait a while, right? You went, How long am I going to be late? And the turkey's going to be over. There. Whatever. We are not excited about detours in our life most of the time, are we? But did you notice how God chose to use this detour? to fulfill his plan? Have you ever kind of processed the idea? It's happened to us a couple of times when we were on a detour and then we found out that something tragic had happened in the direction that we were going. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, God used that detour that was very untimely for me and it wouldn't have been the way I'd have done it, but because he used that, it, he was glorified in that. If you've been part of that, most of you, like me, and once you finally get through that detour, like the Holy Family, 
and you get to the place that you pull into that driveway, that place that, that Dorothy talked about in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like, there's no place like, there is no place like home. When you pull in to that place called home, there's a sense of peace and satisfaction in your life. Now, I love leaving, but whoo, I love coming home. Now, notice, I didn't say pulled up in the driveway to my house. I didn't say pulled up in the driveway to my possessions. I said pulled up in the driveway and my heart was yearning because I was home. And I think it's really cool that the Holy Family as a result of the detour, made it home to Nazareth. Now, here's a question. What does your home look like? Or what does the word home look like? Because I didn't say house look like. I didn't say what does your property look like. I didn't say what do your possessions look like. I said, what does your home look like? Because I am thoroughly convinced that God wants all of us to have a home. He wants us to have a home. Genesis chapter 2, God establishes home. It's a perfect environment. It's great. And he established it so that he could spend the time with mankind. Because after all, we are made in whose image? God's image. In the image that God portrayed for us, God made them male and female in God's image. He created us. In that image, to bless. God created us to bless. He created us to bless the earth and our family. God did not create us to continue to curse one another or live separately from God. Why do I say that? God created a perfect environment, right? Everything was good, right? God came and visited and shared and walked and talked every day with his family, right? Adam and Eve, right? And then who messed it up? We did. Every single one of us, because we are part of that lineage. Every one of us messed up the fact that it's no longer a perfect environment. Home changed. The way that home looks changed. But God created us in his image and desired that we have fellowship daily with him. That we walk with him. That we talk with him. That we share together daily. We call that family most of the time. We call that family. Now when you talk about family, family prepares us for life and ministry. Did you ever think about that? Family. What you learn in family prepares us. When we were younger, there was an expectation that we could be okay. Here's something that I've learned. You put a little small baby in somebody's hand, what do they do? They start, they go, oh, you're right, especially if it's a grandma. Oh, it's the most precious thing ever. The most beautiful, right? We have a tendency to start talking baby talk, don't we? I mean, let's just be honest. We do. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, look at you. You are just so beautiful. Yes, you are. You look just like your mama. So if it's your daughter or if it's your son, you look just like your son, Right? And we start talking that baby talk thing. And then we wonder why our kids grow up and start talking baby talk back to us and we're wondering where they learned it from, right? <laughs> and what, wouldn't you really like to be able to, to hear them say, you know, when I was two weeks old, you remember what you told me? You know, from there. Well, the whole deal is it's a training ground. It's an area for us to learn and to grow in life and in ministry. Now, what was cute for a three-year-old, most of the time is not so cute for a 53-year-old because there is an expectation, there is totally an expectation that you speak, talk, and walk differently as an adult. So family prepares us for life and ministry. Family also teaches us how to be in relationship with one another, how to differ with one another, how to reconcile with one another. Very few of you in this room probably remember that the previous service could. Think about living in a 
two-room house, not a two-bedroom, a two-room house with six siblings and a mom and a dad. That teaches you relationship real quick, doesn't it? Or in my case, living in a house with three ladies and one bathroom. That will teach you how to be in relationship, how to set time, how to communicate, or how to get up really early and take a shower so you have hot water, either one. So I believe that family teaches us and shows us how to be in a relationship with God and one another. Family also prepares us by example, what we see as well as what we are told. We are actually taught to be full-time ministers of the gospel. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I didn't say vocational, I said full-time. Full-time to me is 24-7, 365. Does that pretty much cover every minute and every day? 24-7, 365, this is yes. Yeah, we may want to open the doors. It's getting a little warm in here, a little cool. Folks are falling asleep on me. 24-7, 365. God prepares us for that. And the interesting thing is, most of us, the skills that we have now, the majority of those skills were put in place when we started at home. Now, we've perfected them as we've gone through the education system, or we've perfected them as we've gone through the workforce, or we've perfected them because folks have chosen to invest in us, but the majority of the things that we've learned are as a result of the investment of someone in a home environment. I personally learned manners and hospitality by watching my parents showing care for the needs of others. Home is that training ground for ministry. A boot camp for life, so to speak. And it's not because it's a punishment, it's because it's a discipline that's being instilled. And I truly believe that the church is an instrument that God uses to help reinforce what you learn at home. What did you just hear me say? Is it the church's responsibility to educate you about how to read God's Word? It's the home responsibility. Look in the mirror just for a second. Imagine yourself looking in the mirror and that reflection that's looking back at you, it is your opportunity, your responsibility to model what it is to be a Christian, to have a relationship with God and with others in your household. That's an awesome responsibility when you stop and think about it. Not just responsibility, but privilege. And I believe that God chooses to use the institute of church to help in that. Why? Back to Genesis. God established the institution of marriage before he did the organized church. Now, some theologians will debate that because of the presence of God in visiting the theological presence. But I really believe as far as a human institution that was established, family was established before the church. Look at the order. We have the opportunity to learn and to grow. We are called as a church to make disciples, not create them. Who created you? God did. We didn't. The church didn't. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the organized body of believers that are gathering together. The church comes alongside the parents. The church comes alongside the family to help, but not to do for them. Do not shun that responsibility. Do not give that responsibility away to someone else and think, that's the church's job. It is not the church's job. It is your responsibility because I can tell you in the Anderson household, God's not going to ask me, what did Calvary Baptist Church teach your child about me? They're going to ask me, Chet, what did you teach? Caitlin, Carly, James, and Michael about the love of the Father. And if I chose to use an institution called Calvary Baptist Church or ministry, God's going to say, that's great. You used my bride. You, you used my bride to help you. And I'm looking at folks that are sitting in this room that have invested in family. Are you investing in families that are around you in that home environment? Now, the cool thing, think about this as family. God provides a home for all of us. God provides a home for you. We call it heaven or eternity. John 14 tells us that Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, has gone to prepare a place. In God's house are many rooms. One of those rooms is Chet's room. 
And Jesus is returning one day to take Chet to my home in eternity. Not because I'm deserving of a room in God's house. Not because I'm one of the pastors at Calvary Baptist Church. None of that comes into consideration, and that helps me move on. But because I truly believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he was crucified, that he was buried, and on the third day he arose. And he appeared to many, and he ascended into heaven. In the departing words, I'll come back for you. If I go, I'm coming back for you. And in John 14, reminds us that he is preparing a place in eternity for me. Not because I deserve it, because I accepted the offer of salvation that he gave me. Simply because of that. And folks, I want to remind you, don't spend so much time and energy accumulating stuff. Some of us just went through a big accumulation period of stuff. We have boxes of stuff, and some of you are even fussing about who's going to get the boxes out to put the stuff back in so we can put the stuff away, aren't you? Let's just be honest. I see the heads nodding. If you would spend, if we would spend, if we would spend as much time accumulating friends that we're going to spend eternity with, as we did our stuff, I believe the world would look a lot different than it does today. Are you creating a home environment people want to be part of? Because here's the real question. What kind of home are you building? We talk about it's a journey home, so what kind of home are you building? The more I learn about God, the more I'm convinced He totally created each of us for relationship with Him first and foremost. And then with others. Now, if you've been listening carefully to some of the announcements that we've been given and even watching on here, it sounds a lot like a life group culture that we're trying to build at Calvary. Because a life group culture that's being built or established at Calvary is a place where people of all ages, and I'm looking at people of all ages, races and economic status can join to build relationship with God first and foremost and with others. That's a cultural difference in our community. I believe that there are a few key elements, however, that are needed to create an environment or a place where people want to be. We don't just go somewhere because we want to go. There are certain environmental elements that are present. Now, what are those environmental elements? I believe that there's three primary. Actually, I believe that there's four, but I'm going to give you the three, and then we'll come back to the back side. I believe that the environment must be filled with grace. And that grace is the free and unmerited favor of God. Nothing that we did, did we deserve it. We simply accepted it. And did you notice what it said? The free and unmerited favor. It's mean, I can't be good enough to receive that grace. I must simply surrender and accept it. I believe that the second element that creates an environment of home is love. And you can describe love in a lot of different ways. No greater love than this that a man would give his life, being willing to sacrifice. But love is the ability to openly, listen carefully, openly share and care for each other because you love the folks that you're encountering. Some of us have a real difficulty with openly sharing with each other. I, I'm not talking about the platform here. I'm talking about in small. I'm talking about one-on-one. -on -one. I'm talking about family. Love. So the environment of grace, the environment of love, and then the environment of the element of encouragement. Sharing the truth in love. Encouraging one another. Not picking out everything that was done wrong. Any of you grow up in a household where if you had a list of 100 things to do and you got 99 of them right and you missed one, all you ever heard about was the one? Yeah. You didn't hear about the 99, right? My son Michael busted me on that when he was about 12 years old. He said, Dad, can I just say something? I said, you better be careful. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, sure. I was in one of those. I was walking in the spirit. I was prayed up. Sure, tell me. He said, Dad, you give me a list, and 
He said, you know, every now and then you'll say the things that I did right. He said, but you just harp and harp and harp on the things that I did wrong. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, wow, isn't that true? How would your household look, husbands, if you noticed always the 99 things that were done right and negotiated about the one thing that was done wrong? Or maybe missed. Instead of standing up on the platform and jumping up and down and talking about, yes, but you didn't do this. Because I can tell you they forgot all about the 99 that they did right, if that's the environment. That's an environment of encouragement. Educators are learning that. That kids will perform if they are encouraged to make right choices. I attribute my youngest daughter's success in education to a, a K-5 or either first grade. I don't remember which one it was. She was a brand new teacher right out of college. And, of course, where we were, you could only walk them in one day and then you had to drop them off and let them take care of them. But this is what we found that was happening every day. When my child would come in and everyone would sit down, this brand new teacher would stand up in front of that class and she would look at that class of about 32 students and say, I believe in every one of you. I believe that today you will succeed in everything you try. And I'm going to do everything within my power and effort to help you succeed because I believe in you. Church family, I want to tell you, I believe in every single one of you. And we gather on a weekly basis to invest time because I believe that every one of you can and will succeed this week as a follower of Jesus Christ. And we as a church family are going to do everything within our power and within our ability to help you succeed in that area. I truthfully believe that if we adopted that in our families, our families would look totally different than they do today. If we could change that. Now some of us were taught. And some of us were taught wrongly. Let's just admit it. But we're too stubborn to change it. Here would be my challenge in that area. Ask God. Just because heritage taught you to do it that way. Did not mean that God desired that you do it that way. God's plan trumps any of man's plans always. Remember the detour? Remember the detour. Remember the detour as we look. Now, again, I say that the environment must be reinforced with grace, love, and encouragement. In our group discussion that we have, and Chad and Chad and Chet, which, by the way, Chad, Chad's doing well. He's not sick. He's visiting family, in-laws in Phoenix, and the OC, Chad, the other Chad, is in Texas on his way back. I had to figure out some way to get him out of town so I could preach, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're visiting family during the holidays. But in our discussion, Chad asked the question, what elements need to be present? And we talked about grace, and we talked about love, and we talked about encouragement. And I was sitting there shaking my head, and you know how Chad is. If you've ever had a conversation with Chad, he's going to pull it out of you. Well, what? And I said, I think there's an element that's missing. I said, first and foremost, before you can have those other three, I think there has to be, there must be, there needs to be an environment of safety both safe physically and emotional for all of the rest of that to happen in the home. Because if you don't have that safe physical environment and you don't have that same safe emotional environment, grace is not going to be felt and displayed. and You're not going to build a home that folks are going to want to come to, whether it's family or friends. Men, I want to talk to you just for a minute. And why? Who did, who did the angel appear to when he told him to, Time to come home. Joseph. Who was Joseph? He was the father. He was the earthly father protecting and looking after his children. So men, I want to talk to you just for a second here. Men, it's not okay to allow violence and slander to live in your household. It is absolutely not okay. It is not biblical, nor is it scriptural. It's not okay. Because if that is allowed to continue in your home, and some of it is continuing, 
That will relate to your family that that environment is not safe for your family nor your friends or their friends, and they will not want to be there. Help develop and create an environment that will. Because you see, I believe that every man, every woman, and every child should be able to have one place in this entire universe called Earth that they can be and feel safe, not abused physically or emotionally, period. Dads, it's up to you to lead the moms and the children to make that happen in your family. Men, it's time to step up and create that as an environment. You see, at the Anderson household, we call that type of environment home. Where are you guys headed? We're headed home, Dad. I'll see you at home, son. I'll see you at home. Now, this is a temporary place, remember? This earth is temporary for us. Our real home is where? Eternity, if we've started that journey with Jesus. Each of us has been given the gift of creating a home environment that's safe, that's filled with grace, covered in love, and filled up to the brim with encouragement. That will show our families what a relationship with Jesus Christ looks like. Now, some of us have a lot of work to do in that area. So here's my final question. How are you using the gift of home God's given you to make a difference in? How are you using it? Father, thanks for allowing us the opportunity to journey home. You spoke clearly. You kept your family safe. But Father, sometimes tragedy happens. And so we give you the honor for that tragedy as well. But my prayer is that through your Holy Spirit, you would challenge our hearts to continue to worship in this place as we journey to that place called home through our relationship with your son, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.